We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, why is it the case that this SNP government is still choosing to invest less in general practice than is invested in other parts of the United Kingdom? First Minister. Well, I wouldn't... I wouldn't accept that characterisation. What we know is that we are investing record sums in our National Health Service more generally. And of course, per capita spending on the National Health Service in Scotland is significantly higher than it is elsewhere in the UK. If we were to match UK levels, we would require to take, I think, around £850 million pounds out of our NHS budget in a single year. So our spending levels are ahead of the rest of the UK. Uh, looking at general practice, or rather primary care more generally, which is uh, more appropriate these days as we seek to expand the primary care teams, uh, we have set a very clear target to shift the balance of spend into primary uh, care and achieve a particular proportion of the overall NHS budget that is dedicated to services in GP practices and the wider primary care team. So we will go on with doing that work. It's the right direction of travel. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it is accompanied by, for example, the integration of health and social care, we are the first part of the UK to undertake that reform. It, I think, underlines the fact that this is a government that is both investing in our National Health Service and carrying out the essential reforms to it. Jackson Carlo. Well, that's a pretty speech, but it's not actually an answer to the question I posed. In each and every one of the last five years, investment in general practice has been lower in Scotland than it has been south of the border. A spending gap that's amounted now to a whopping £660 million of support lost to primary care in Scotland. The Royal College of GPs is now warning that over the next five years, as a consequence of extra demand on services, we could be short of more than 900 family doctors in Scotland due, in their words, to a long-standing underfunding of GP practices. First Minister, are they wrong? First Minister. We, we are working uh, with general practitioners. We're working with wider primary care teams. I've already uh, made uh, the point, which is beyond any argument, about the higher levels of per capita NHS spend in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. Uh, also, by the end of this Parliament, and this is uh, a target that has clearly been set, we'll be investing an additional £500 million in primary care, uh, which includes £250 million in direct support of uh, general practice, and that will raise the primary care share of the NHS frontline budget to 11% by the end of this parliament, something that at the time that was set was, uh, I seem to recall, welcomed uh, by GPs and the wider primary care uh, teams. Of course, uh, we will also ensure a pay rise for uh, GPs uh, to ensure that general practice remains an attractive career. We have a whole range of recruitment initiatives and incentives in place to get more people, not just into uh, medical professions, but into general practice in particular. And of course, we have the new GP contract uh, now in place, which ensures that GPs are uh, well rewarded uh, and that we have the right focus on building primary care teams. And finally, in terms of uh, comparison with the rest of the UK, which uh, Jackson Carlow, when I make comparisons with the rest of the UK, he says it's not legitimate to do so, but of course, uh, he is doing exactly that today, but we have more GPs uh, per, per 100,000 of our population than the rest of the UK. Uh, in Scotland, we have 91 uh, for every 100,000 people, uh, compared to just 71 per 100,000 people in England. So I think a ra record uh, stands scrutiny, and of course we set out a very clear direction of travel for the future. Jackson Carlo. Well, I'm sure the Royal College of GPs will be very impressed with that slap down. Um, last, week, last week, in very revealing language, the First Minister said that the £550 million coming in help, her words, was only £550 million. Yeah. Well, I've had a look, and it turns out that's actually nearly £200 million more than the Scottish Government's own increase for the NHS in their last budget. Why is it all hearts and flowers when Nicola Sturgeon comes up with the money and all grudge and grievance when it's Westminster that yes. gives an extra 550 million to Scotland's NHS? Well we are clear, we are clear more of that increased resource should be going to general practice. Why? Because self-evidently more funding to GPs will help our NHS, help people keep people out of hospital and help reduce demand in critical services. The SNP say they will eventually increase spending in primary care to 11% of NHS spending. But GPs are also being told, as they were just now, they'll have to wait till 2021 to see it. Why the wait? 
Will she do the right thing and give Scotland's GPs and patients the support they need now? Yes. First Minister. Well, perhaps, perhaps if Jackson Carlow had looked at this a bit more closely in advance of uh, these questions, he would have known that investment in primary care has gone up in every single year of this yeah. government. And of course, now we are working towards that 11% target. Why does that have to be done uh, over a phased basis so that we don't destabilise acute services as we do that? We've got to make sure we get that balance right. But let me give Jackson Carlaw a, a few more facts for him uh, to chew over perhaps after uh, this exchange uh, has finished. Overall health spending is over 7% higher per head in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. And as I said a moment ago, if we were to match the UK government health spending plans, that would see our National Health Service lose £850 million in this year alone. We've given a commitment to pass on all uh, revenue consequentials to the National Health Service. Uh, can I say, just as an aside, uh, those consequentials are not just a gift from the UK government. They come from Scottish taxpayers' yeah. money yeah. that goes to the Treasury before it comes back to Scotland. But I think two contextual points still require to be made. Uh, yes, that £550 million pounds uh, is well. Actually, three contextual points. That would be wiped out if we were to give tax cuts to the richest, as the Tories want us to do. But secondly, that £550 million, however welcome it may be, is not the £600 million pounds that the Tories were promising the Scottish budget. So the Tories, yet again, are short-changing the Scottish uh, budget and the Scottish Health Service. And lastly, presiding officer, it doesn't take away the fact, uh, a fact that is confirmed by the Fraser of Allender Institute in the report uh, this very morning, that over the decade, uh, from the Tories coming to power in 2010 to the end of this decade, the Scottish budget will reduce in real terms, £2 billion real term reduction in uh, the Scottish budget. So we'll take no lectures from the Conservatives on these matters. Instead, we'll continue to provide record funding for our National Health Service. Jackson Carlaw. Actually, the Fraser of Inst Allender Institute are crystal clear. According to them, health spending in Scotland is going to double the previous projections. And the record of this government no longer fills people with any confidence. We, we just heard the First Minister say we don't want to destabilise the NHS. In a week when we have had warnings of huge job losses in NHS Tayside, locum consultants in the Highlands picking up 400,000 a year, delayed discharge in Scotland reaching its worst level in two years despite promises to abolish it, all part of a growing legacy not of destabilising just but 11 and a half years of SNP incompetence in Scotland's health service. The 550 million budget investment in Scotland's NHS is an opportunity to put in place a sustainable long-term plan. Yep. And this morning, Fraser of Allender explicitly report, if the SNP doesn't take this opportunity, even more money will eventually be needed. Saving the family doctor is our priority. Securing the future of GPs is essential. So will the First Minister use this investment to plan for the long term, or is it to be squandered yet again, as it has been for over a decade, on short-term fixes? Yeah. First Minister. Well, of course, Jackson Carlaw starts his uh, questioning today suggesting we're not spending enough money on the National Health Service. He then cites a Fraser of Allender Institute report that shows the proportion of the total Scottish Government budget dedicated to health is actually uh, rising and has been rising uh, year on year. He talks about confidence uh, but forgets to tell us that uh, patient satisfaction uh, is at a record high since 2014. 86% of people rated their inpatient experience uh, positively. Uh, he also uh, forgets uh, to uh, remember that, of course, the Fraser of Allender report today says that per capita, the real term reduction in the Scottish Government budget over the decade uh, is 7%. So these uh, are the facts. Uh, he also mentions delayed uh, discharge. The most recent uh, annual report published in September of this year uh, showed a reduction of 6% uh, in terms of bed days lost to delayed discharge. That builds on a 3% reduction the previous year and a 9% reduction the year before that. That's a 37% uh, decrease in delayed uh, discharge since 2006. So these are, are the fruits of our investment and we will continue to invest in the health service and continue to reform uh, the health service 
as of course the Tory government in Westminster continues to preside over real terms cuts to the Scottish budget. So we'll go on with the job of delivering for patients right across the country. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, time limits are essential in any legal system. But does the First Minister think that governmental bodies should have up to 20 years before they begin to pursue a person for debt? First Minister. Um, I'm sure Richard Leonard is going to tell me the particular context in which he is asking uh, this question. Um, and when, when he uh, does so, I'd be happy to, to seek to answer it uh, in more detail. Obviously, the different contexts uh, that might apply here may have uh, an implication uh, for the answer that I would give. So I look forward to hearing his next question. Richard Leonard. Um, well, th this afternoon, this Parliament will be debating the prescription bill. And under the current system, the Department of Work and Pensions can take up to 20 years to notify people of debt relating to the overpayment of benefits. And it's not just the DWP. Scotland's councils also have 20 years before they have to notify people about a council tax debt. We think it is unfair that a person can be chased for a debt 20 years after it was incurred that they had no knowledge of and when no previous action has been taken. This can be ended in this parliament this afternoon. In stage three of the prescription bill, Labour will put forward amendments to cut that period to five years. That means Scotland's councils and the DWP under Scots law would have five years to notify people of their debt, not 20. So why are SNP MSPs planning to vote against this proposal this afternoon? First Minister. To, to protect uh, debtors, actually. Um, and I'm glad Richard Leonard has now told me what he's asking about. If he'd done that in his first question, I could have given him, I could have given him the answer. He was looking for COSLA. COSLA, Scotland's local authorities, have been very clear in the submissions they made at stage one of the prescription bill that any amendment that shortens uh, the period in which uh, overpayments can be recovered would hurt debtors uh, the most uh, because the debt if it would have to be recovered within uh, five years could mean higher repayment installments which would potentially cause greater hardship to debtors so we have listened uh, to the view of COSLA. Uh, COSLA uh, also uh, said, and I'm, I'm going to quote COSLA here, the consequences of moving to a five-year prescription period would be so significant that any consideration of such a change should be subject uh, to full public consultation and financial uh, scrutiny. This bill is not the place uh, to try to make changes uh, to council tax or indeed other reserved uh, benefits by the back door. So there may be a wider uh, discussion to be had here, but of course Parliament will have considered all of these issues uh, as this bill uh, went through the different stages of the process. And the Scottish Government uh, have accepted the view of the Scottish Law Commission uh, that the proposals uh, should be uh, accepted and the exceptions should maintain the status quo as it is generally understood. Richard Leonard. Well, let me be clear. Labour's amendments are supported by Citizens Advice Scotland, by Money Advice Scotland and the debt charity Step Change. These are organisations on the front line who day in and day out witness the human cost of this unjust and unfair system. They have told us of a parent who stopped receiving child tax credits 10 years ago who was recently presented with a bill for almost £4,000. Of a son who moved in with his mother to care for her who was handed a bill of over £3,000 for council tax arrears going back eight years. First Minister, the system as it stands is not only unnecessary, it is cruel. It does not serve the interests of the individual, but it does not serve the public interest either. And we have the opportunity to change that this afternoon. So why won't the First Minister grab that opportunity? First Minister. Well, I've, I've explained the reasons uh, 
for that. Uh, these issues, of course, uh, have been considered as the bill uh, went through its different parliamentary stages. Uh, but it is important to say uh, that there's been no dedicated uh, consultation, as I understand it, on these specific uh, amendments. And I think there is a view uh, that while there may well be a wider debate here, and I certainly would hope that all councils or other organisations would act sensitively in the kind of cases that Richard uh, Leonard raises here. But if there is a wider debate to be had, it's better that that happens properly uh, with full scrutiny and full uh, public consultation. And I'm happy to give an undertaking that the government will consider whether that wider uh, discussion is merited. But this is a narrowly drawn bill and I think it would uh, be wrong to make these changes by the back door rather than focusing on them properly. We have a number of uh, constituency supplementaries. The first from Shuna Robertson to be followed by Finlay Carson. Shuna Robertson. Will the First Minister take this opportunity to join me in paying tribute to the Michelin workforce and local managers in Dundee in the way that they've shown such resilience, tenacity and flexibility in the face of previous and, of course, current challenges? And will she reaffirm her support and that of the Scottish Government to do everything within her power to do whatever is possible to help either retain or repurpose the plant and save as many jobs as possible. And finally, will she use her offices to help persuade the UK government as a minimum to contribute a further £50 million to the Tay Cities deal to match Scottish government funding? First Minister. Well, can I thank uh, Shona Robinson for her question and also uh, thank her for her engagement with Derek Mackay uh, over the last few ways, uh, days to make sure uh, that discussions uh, with the local management at Michelin and indeed with the unions have been as constructive as they have been. Uh, this uh, news this week has clearly been devastating for the 845 workers at Michelin and for their families and of course for the wider community in Dundee. My thoughts are with all of them at this time. Uh, let me be very clear, as Derek Mackay was in this chamber uh, earlier in the week, that we uh, will do everything we can uh, to find a sustainable future for this plant. Our absolute priority is to pursue options for the site to continue with commercial production, uh, and we will leave no stone unturned in working with Michelin, uh, with Dundee Council and with other partners to secure a positive future for the plant, for its workers and for the wider community. And I hope we have the support of uh, all sides of the chamber as we take that work forward. Uh, yes, we will continue to call on the UK government to match the contribution from the Scottish uh, government to the Tay City region uh, deal. Uh, we, of course, in the Scottish government, Derek Mackay said this in the chamber on uh, Tuesday, uh, the Scottish government will continue to look at all uh, reasonable suggestions for additional funding from the Scottish government, but a good place to start would be for the UK government to commit an additional £50 million to match that contribution from uh, the Scottish Government and to ensure uh, that all partners can look to invest that money in a way that's for the, the benefit of the wider community. So we will do everything possible to support Michelin, to support its workers and to support Dundee. Finlay Carson to be followed by Gail Rose. Finlay Carson. Stranar Station and Stranar was without a train service for two months down to Platform 4 at Air Station being closed due to safety concerns surrounding the stability of Air Station Hotel. There was also a number of weekend, weekends when this coincided with road closures and lengthy delays, and this would be totally unacceptable elsewhere. I want to put on record the hard work of ScotRail Alliance and others on the task force in getting trains running again last weekend. However, further line closures must, like this must not happen again. Will the First Minister give the people of Stranraer a personal commitment that will, she will intervene to ensure that contingency plans can be quickly instated, which will see temporary platforms set up south of air in the event of Platform 4 being closed in the future? First Minister. We will do everything uh, possible to mitigate any uh, disruption happening in the future. I know how difficult this situation uh, has been. Of course, what happened at Air uh, Station it was unavoidable um, and uh, we acted uh, as Scott Rail acted as quickly as possible to ensure that disruption was kept to a minimum. It's good that trains uh, are running again and we must uh, all work to ensure uh, that the right plans in, are in place and the right contingency options are in place uh, to ensure that that disruption is not replicated and I give uh, that undertaking today. Gail Ross to be followed by Neil Bibby. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Scretting UK has announced this week that it will cease all operations in the UK, including their manufacturing base in my constituency in Invergordon. 
What support can the Scottish Government give to both the employees in Invergordon and its storage site at Kishhorn, who will be affected by this decision? First Minister. Well, I was very concerned to hear that Scretting plans to cease production at its plant in Invergordon and close its distribution centre on Shetland. This will obviously be an anxious time for the company staff, their families and the local areas involved. Highlands and Islands Enterprise is engaged with the company locally and is seeking to engage with Scretting management in Norway. Uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise is exploring all possible avenues of support to help secure a buyer for the business and retain jobs. Uh, however, in the unfortunate, uh, it, unfortunate event that there uh, will be job losses, our PACE team stands ready to offer its full support to staff. Uh, obviously, PACE uh, does everything it can to help those affected by redundancy get back into work as quickly as possible. We understand uh, there are no immediate prospects of job losses at the warehouse in Kishhorn, uh, used by Scretting and operated by a third party. So I can assure Gail Ross that everything possible uh, will be done to support the company and the workers involved. Neil Bibby. Presiding officer, I'm sure the whole chamber is aware of the tragic case of Craig McClelland and all of our thoughts are with his three little children who grew up who will grow up without their father. They will do so because he was murdered by a dangerous criminal who was unlawfully at large and had been for nearly six months. Two reviews have indicated that there were significant failures, but we're not specifically tasked with looking at what went wrong in this case. Craig's family have conducted themselves with unbelievable strength and dignity. Unfortunately, they have not been able to find the answers to the questions they have been asking. And they still do not have confidence that the correct lessons have been learned or that changes have been made to prevent this kind of tragedy from happening to another family. The McClellan family now believe only a full public inquiry will give them the answers they deserve. Can the, can the First Minister give them their, her support? First Minister. Well, th this was an absolutely awful crime and I can't begin to imagine how Craig McClellan's family and friends are feeling. I'm not surprised uh, that there are answers that they still seek uh, and feel that they uh, have not yet uh, had the opportunity to get. Uh, the two inspectorates, of course, uh, reviewed the processes that led to uh, James Wright, who committed this awful crime, uh, being released uh, and the actions that were then taken to apprehend him. Of course, the Justice Secretary uh, set out the Scottish Government's acceptance of all of the recommendations from the inspectorates and uh, set out in this chamber a number of um, immediate additional safeguards that have been or will be put in place to strengthen the home detention curfew uh, processes. For example, there is now a presumption that individuals convicted of violence and knife crime will not, in normal circumstances, receive home detention uh, curfews. So lessons uh, have been learned from this uh, dreadful, uh, tragic case, uh, and uh, I, I hope that is something that members across the chamber uh, welcome. Uh, in terms of uh, the further action that Craig McClellan's uh, family uh, consider is appropriate, uh, the Justice Secretary has offered to meet with them again, and that offer stands. And uh, the Justice the Secretary will be very happy to discuss with them uh, the actions they consider appropriate and give full consideration as government uh, to each and every one of them. Question number three, Willie Rennie. I want to return to Michelin in Dundee. This is real people's lives and real people's jobs. They have a right to expect governments and local authorities to stand up for them. Michelin has been a giant presence in the city of Dundee. We need to do everything we can through the Tay City deals and other measures to keep as many jobs in the city as possible. When Michelin pulled out of their Balamina plant, there was a decent redundancy deal for the workers that paid proper respect to their service. Workers deserve that. Will the First Minister make sure that any Dundee workers made redundant get that Balamina deal or better? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I thank Willie Rennie for raising this issue and uh, agree with him entirely that this is a, an incredibly important issue. This is real people and real jobs, and the government will do everything that we possibly can uh, to support them in these incredibly difficult times. Um, in agreeing with Willie Rennie's point, I hope he will understand when I say that, of course, if redundancies are inevitable here, then uh, we will want to see workers getting the best possible deal. And Michelin, as I understand it, have already given commitments that that will be the case. But we don't want, at this stage, to assume that that is an inevitable outcome. Our focus right now is in doing everything we can to try to find a sustainable future uh, for the plant that will see commercial production 
uh, continue at the plant and the action group that will meet under the uh, convenership on, on Monday uh, of Derek Mackay will be very much focused on bringing a plan together and Scottish Enterprise will be central to that. Now, in these situations, of course, we cannot stand here and guarantee that that will prove to be possible. Uh, but if it doesn't prove to be possible, it will not be for the want of trying. So if Willie, uh, I hope Willie Rennie will understand that that's what we want to focus on in the short to medium term. But of course, if redundancies uh, do happen, of course, we will absolutely demand that workers get the best possible package. Willie Rennie. The First Minister is right to focus on keeping as many jobs as possible. And I'm pleased that the company have given that commitment and I hope we hold them to that commitment too. Another issue that won't help those Michelin workers is Brexit. I was pleased that the Scottish Parliament yesterday officially backed a people's vote. We've gone from the support of five to 65 MSPs. Momentum is building for the British people to have the final say, to save us from the economic damage that will come with Brexit. The First Minister has previously talked of compromising with the UK government. The backstop could involve the whole of the UK remaining in the customs union for an unspecified time. Can the First Minister clarify if that is enough for her to support the deal? I hope she rejects it and opposes everything but a people's vote. But what does she think? First Minister. Uh, no, that wouldn't be enough for me to give my support uh, to that deal. I've made very clear, and I've, I've said this uh, previously, openly, expressly, explicitly, the, the bottom line for the Scottish Government, and I, I make no apology for trying to compromise in the interests of the Scottish people, uh, but the absolute bottom line uh, for me, for the Scottish Government, for my party, uh, would be permanent unequivocal membership of both the single market and the customs uh, union. Uh, that said, I would prefer that we stayed in the European Union as full members. I would prefer that Scotland was in the European Union uh, as full independent uh, members uh, of it. So we will continue uh, to do everything we can to protect Scotland's interests, to protect Scottish jobs, to protect Scottish uh, living standards. And it's for that reason, of course, that we have said uh, that if this proposal comes before uh, the House of Commons, then we would also uh, support the option of a people's vote to give uh, the people right across the UK uh, the opportunity to change their mind. Of course, it wouldn't involve people in Scotland changing their mind because the people of Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain at the first time of asking. We have a couple of further supplementaries. The first from Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, this Parliament's Education Committee heard from two members of the Scottish Youth Parliament who told us how the rise in instrumental music tuition fees of hundreds of pounds were creating Victorian levels of inequality where only the wealthy could afford to take up an instrument. Does the First Minister believe that this is acceptable or does she recognise that councils need the powers to raise the money they need to give our young people all of the opportunities that they deserve? First Minister. Well, of course, some councils uh, provide uh, music tuition on the basis that Ross Greer is suggesting already. So we would encourage other local authorities uh, to look at that as well. Of course, uh, the Scottish Government provides uh, support for other music initiatives. The STEMA, uh, for example, I'm not suggesting for a second uh, that is a substitute for uh, music uh, tuition in schools. Uh, in terms of the overall support we provide to local councils, uh, with, uh, of course, the agreement of the Green Party, we, uh, in this financial year, are providing real terms increases in the uh, budgets that local government have to spend. And, of course, uh, we are uh, currently in the process of finalising our budget for next year, where I'm sure uh, local government finance, as well as a whole range of other matters, uh, will continue to be subjects of intense discussion. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of last week's attack on Neil Lennon and the subsequent comments from, Mis from Mr Lennon that, that, that the numerous attacks he's endured in Scotland resulted from bigotry and racism. Such treatment is wholly unacceptable in a modern progressive country. Will the First Minister join me in condemning anti-Catholic bigotry and anti-Irish racism and commit the Scottish Government to urgent action, along with <laughs> urgent action to root out these unacceptable attitudes and behaviour. First Minister. Uh, can I thank James Kelly for raising uh, an issue that I know is of huge concern to uh, people across the country. Let me say uh, at the outset and unequivoc unequivocally that I condemn the attack on Neil Lennon that took place uh, last week. Of course, that is a matter for the police to thoroughly uh, investigate. 
Uh, I saw some of uh, Neil Lennon's press conference uh, at the end of last week and thought uh, he conducted himself with great dignity. Nobody should have to suffer uh, the abuse and the attacks that he has had to suffer, and I'm sure all of us would agree with that. I unequivocally uh, condemn anti-Catholic uh, bigotry, anti-Irish racism. I condemn sectarianism in any uh, shape or form. Uh, and this government will continue to take uh, the action we need to take to ensure that Scotland is a country that demonstrates zero tolerance of any uh, of that uh, kind of uh, bigotry. Whatever your footballing loyalties or, or whether you don't have any uh, footballing uh, loyalties, that kind of conduct has no place in modern Scotland. And all of us must unite to make that absolutely crystal clear. Gillian Martin. Special rapporteurs in Scotland to begin an inquiry into rising poverty across the UK. This comes on the back of Trussell Trust figures showing that food bank use in Scotland has risen by 15%, driven by the rollout of universal credit. How will the Scottish Government engage with this inquiry? First Minister. Uh, well, I will uh, meet the UN Special Rapporteur uh, later this afternoon. Uh, other government ministers uh, will also be uh, meeting uh, with him and uh, his team, and we will look to be very constructive in our engagement with uh, that inquiry. We will be setting out the actions the Scottish Government is taking to tackle poverty, uh, to see the assault on poverty as a human rights-based issue, which I think is extremely important. But we will also be taking the opportunity to raise concerns, uh, certainly about universal credit, but also about the UK Government's welfare cuts more generally, because it is those cuts uh, that are driving more and more people into poverty uh, and seeing demand and reliance on food food banks, for example, rising. So uh, I hope that we see uh, this inquiry, uh, when it concludes and publishes its outcome, uh, be a helpful contribution to the work that all of us are doing uh, to consign poverty to the dustbin of history. Question four, James Dornan. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government supports the real living wage. First Minister. Uh, currently, 80.6% of employees in Scotland are paid at least the living wage, making Scotland the best performing of all UK countries. This week, uh, I announced an increase in the real living wage rate, so people who receive it in Scotland will earn £9 an hour. Uh, we've provided funding to enable adult social care workers to be paid the real living wage, and from 2020, that rate will be paid to all workers delivering funded child care hours. Uh, we continue to work with partners to deliver our commitment to lift at least 25,000 more people onto the real living wage in the next three years. And we're also working to adopt a fair work first approach by extending fair work criteria, including payment of the real living wage to as many funding streams, business support grants and contracts as we possibly can. James Dornan. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but, but does the First Minister agree with me that it's a disgrace that the UK Government failed to use their budget to finally put in place a real living wage for every worker and continues to subject workers under the age of 25 to a lower pay for no justifiable reason? First Minister. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I, I would make two points. I think the UK government uh, should unequivocally get behind the real uh, living wage that's independently assessed as the level that people need for a decent standard of uh, living. And secondly, I think the age discrimination uh, that is currently part of the, the government living wage is unacceptable uh, in modern times. Uh, we think that people uh, who do the same jobs should be paid the same wages regardless of what age they are. And of course, that is uh, one of the many reasons why I hope that in the not too distant future we see these powers devolved to the Scottish Parliament so that we, instead of the UK government, can take these decisions. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the study defying arthritis at every age, what the Scottish Government is doing to reduce loneliness and isolation among people suffering with the condition. First Minister. Uh, I welcome this research and recognise the importance of raising awareness of the challenges that those living with arthritis can experience. We know that particular groups of people, like those with long-term health conditions, can be at greater risk of experiencing social isolation and loneliness. Uh, we're committed to publishing a strategy to tackle social isolation and loneliness, which will reflect those risks and outline a programme of work designed to address these issues. The Minister for Public Health is meeting with the group that commissioned the research this afternoon to discuss how we can uh, work together to improve the lives of people living with arthritis. Ryan Whittle. Can I thank the, the First Minister for that answer? Uh, despite the fact that a staggering uh, one in six people are living with arthritis, a lack of understanding of the condition has led to an epidemic of isolation, according to the Versus Arthritis Report. The British Society of Rheumatology published a new report yesterday 
on the state of play of rheumatology services in Scotland. In it, they note that the waiting times for a first appointment has almost doubled uh, since 2010, from an average of 41 days to 79 days, against a 2016 Scottish Government target of 28 days. First Minister, the report states there is a 12-week window after the onset of arthritis symptoms where referral to a specialist can reduce these symptoms, thereby helping to reduce disability and work limitations. So given that a lack of mobility is often a key factor in increasing loneliness and isolation, when can the Scottish Government expect to hit its own stated target on waiting times for rheumatology appointments? First Minister. Well, of course, the Health Secretary set out a couple of weeks ago in this uh, chamber the waiting times delivery plan that we are now working towards and investing considerable sums of money to make sure uh, that we achieve uh, the targets in uh, that plan. More generally, I think it is absolutely uh, correct that we need to do more to raise awareness around arthritis and make sure that uh, those suffering from it, uh, particularly those newly diagnosed, uh, get access to the support that they need uh, so that they can continue to be active and independent in their own uh, communities. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Minister for Public Health is meeting with Versus Arthritis this afternoon and looks forward to discussing all aspects of this research uh, so that we can ensure uh, that government policy, whether that is around uh, health service waiting times or the wider loneliness and social isolation work, uh, reflects the actions that need to be taken to address some of the issues identified in the report. Bob Doris. Uh, thanks, President Officer. First Minister, digital connectivity can make a significant contribution to tackling loneliness and isolation for older people, yet 38% of 65- to 79-year-olds report not being able to use a computer at all. How is the Scottish Government seeking to address such inequalities and tackle loneliness amongst our older citizens? Well, it is very important that older people can get online and the Scottish Government is certainly committed to helping them to do so. Uh, the most recent Scottish Household Survey shows a significant increase in, in internet use by adults over 60 in the last 10 years. It's gone from 29% in 2007 to 63% in 2017, but we want more people to benefit from digital opportunities. Our Digital Participation Charter Fund, uh, which was launched in partnership with BT, has made awards of over uh, £200,000 to 26 organisations for digital inclusion projects, and older people are a priority group for that. Uh, the Minister for Public Finance and Digital is also leading work with older people to better understand how digital technologies can add value to their lives in ways that are meaningful to them. Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, many with MS and arthritis say that they will benefit from the medical, uh, medical cannabis and it will help with muscle spasms or stiffness. I've raised this issue with the First Minister before. I'm sure you recognise I congratulate the UK government who have been allowed for prescriptions to be made for medicinal cannabis. Uh, given that, is she able to say uh, when the Scottish government would be able to issue some guidelines so that GPs can freely um, prescribe medical cannabis where they think it's appropriate and you will know that the many arthritis sufferers do feel that they would benefit from that? First Minister. Well, I, I'm told by the Health Secretary we have already issued uh, such guidance and I will ask her to send uh, Polly McNeill a copy of that. More generally, uh, as I think I've said in exchanges with Polly McNeill on this issue previously, I am broadly supportive uh, of medicinal uh, use for, uh, of cannabis or uh, drugs that are derived from uh, cannabis. Uh, obviously, these issues are not entirely within the control of the Scottish Government. That's why we rely on Westminster decisions. Uh, but on the issue of guidance, I'll make sure that a copy is sent to Pauline McNeill later today. Question number six, Rhoda Grant. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to support mountain rescue teams. First Minister. The uh, Scottish Government provides annual grant funding of more than £300,000 uh, to Scottish Mountain Rescue to help the organisation and all 27 Scottish civilian volunteer teams to effectively carry out their vital work. Uh, we're the only government in the UK to fund Mountain Rescue in this way. In addition, we are currently providing £100,000 over three years uh, from 2016-17, as well as advice on procurement to assist with replacing Scottish Mountain Rescue's radio equipment. Uh, Scottish Government officials also work with Scottish Mountain Rescue and responder agencies to help resolve any issues which arise around the coordination of multi-agency working. Rhoda Grant. Mountain Rescue volunteers put their own lives at risk to save others, and therefore it's sad that these teams believe that they're seen as expendable by the agencies. If they were recreational climbers, they would be airlifted off the hill. 
Can I ask the First Minister if Police Scotland are able to tax these rescue services to airlift mountain rescue teams on and off the mountains? And if so, will she ensure that they do that, especially when volunteers are carrying out the distressing task of retrieving bodies of those who have sadly perished on the hills or when their time back to base is excessive or indeed when they're carrying equipment that poses a danger to their own safety? Will she make sure that these agencies support and protect our mountain rescue teams? First Minister. Well, I thank Rhoda Grant for raising the issue. Firstly, can I take the opportunity to say that mountain rescue volunteers do a vital job, often putting their own lives at risk. I do not uh, consider them to be dispensable. I don't think anybody in this chamber or anybody across uh, the country would consider uh, that to be the case. So uh, I'm sure we all want to take the opportunity to thank them uh, for the role that they perform. I am aware of concerns that have been raised uh, by independent Scottish Mountain uh, Rescue about current search and rescue helicopter support arrangements. Uh, Scottish Government officials have previously raised these issues with the Coast Guard Agency uh, following earlier correspondence with the teams. Uh, Police Scotland have legislative responsibility for search and rescue uh, in Scotland. However, the levers for change around search and rescue helicopter support remains at a UK government uh, level. Police Scotland are introducing their helicopter to assist mountain rescue teams as a last resort for body recovery. Uh, I know that Police Scotland have written to independent Scottish Mountain Rescue about these changes and the response to that has been positive. I understand uh, that the Coast Guard Agency has also uh, now written to them to extend an invitation for a meeting, uh, which I understand has been accepted. So uh, I will ask the relevant minister uh, perhaps to write to Rhoda Grant with some more detail of the work we're doing to make sure that the appropriate arrangements are in place. Liz Smith. Uh, does the First Minister accept that the uh, concerns raised by mountain rescue teams, one issue here is the centralisation of Police Scotland that has diluted the interaction of mountain rescue teams and local police officers who know the relevant area much better than anyone else and that this can impact, according to these mountain rescue teams, on the ability to coordinate the mountain rescue to respond with the necessary experience? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I don't agree with that, actually, uh, at all. I don't think there is any evidence that that is the case. Um, however, there are a number of issues that have been raised, uh, the issues that I've just gone through uh, with Rhoda Grant. As I say, we take responsibility, as does Police Scotland, where we have that responsibility, but much of this, of course, lies with the Coast Guard Agency. Much of this uh, still lies at UK government level. So we will continue to take the action and make the appropriate representations uh, for mountain rescue teams to make sure they get the support that they need. And I hope all of us uh, will uh, resist the temptation to be party political about these issues and instead get behind our mountain rescue teams and the fantastic work that they do. Question number seven, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the proposal by Scottish Water to remove the 25% single-person discount from at least half a million customers, including older people. First Minister. Well, firstly, there is no proposal to remove uh, this discount. Uh, we recently consulted on investment priorities and principles of water charging for the 2021 to 27 regulatory period, uh, which consulted on whether reducing the single person discount could fund an increase in the maximum discount available to households on full council tax reduction from 25% to 50%. Uh, we're currently reviewing the responses to this consultation, but crucially, any detailed changes to charging policies would be subject to further consultation with customers and stakeholders in the course of the next year prior to implementation in the 2021 to 2027 period. But let me stress, absolutely no uh, decisions on this issue have been taken. Jackie Bailey. It turns out, First Minister, that it's not a Scottish water proposal. It's actually a Scottish government proposal. Um, and we can fight over words about whether it's remove or reduce, but you are effectively proposing to cut the discount. On that basis, will the First Minister rule out now any cut to the single person's discount for water? No one would dispute helping the poorest more, but you shouldn't be funding it by taking money from lone pensioners on fixed incomes who are equally struggling. And because people are concerned that this is the thin end of the wedge, will she also take this opportunity to rule out cuts to the single person's council tax discount, something her own SNP MSPs have in the past suggested should be scrapped? Will the First Minister give a commitment now 
that her government will not penalise single households, particularly as many are pensioners on low fixed incomes. First Minister. Well, what I will do is carry on uh, and the government will continue to review the responses to the consultation and then we will take decisions in the normal course. That's what's called responsible uh, government. Uh, and the decisions we take uh, when we take them will be progressive. They're all about making sure that the help we provide to people goes to those people who need it most. And, you know, let me quote Citizens Advice Scotland about the proposal to increase the maximum reduction for recipients of the uh, water charges reduction scheme from 25% to 50%. They welcomed that because it would provide additional benefit to over 340,000 households on full council tax uh, reduction and another 160,000 on pa partial council tax reduction. So uh, these are important issues. It's right that the Scottish Government fully consults on them. Any detailed uh, changes, of course, would then require to go through a further process of consultation. So Parliament will have uh, plenty of opportunity to discuss any proposals that come forward. But no decisions have been taken at this stage uh, and the Scottish Government will continue to give them proper and full consideration. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. As members may know, normally at this time we move to members' business, but today, given the significance of the anniversary, we're going to move on to a motion of remembrance to mark 100 years since the ending of the First World War. We're just going to take a short pause, however, to allow... There'll be many members in the gallery um, who, who, who need to leave now and many more who wish to come in. So we're going to just take a short pause uh, to allow the gallery to clear. <laughs>